to pray with him yesterday, and let's continue. I told him the church is praying, and let's pray that every one of those uh, clots will just be completely, completely dissolved, and he'll get through this difficult time. And we want to pray for Sister Deidre Linder's mother, Sister Diane, in Pensacola, Florida. She's been in a coma now for a week, hasn't it been a week? About a week now. And uh, we're just holding her up to God every day in prayer. And uh, it's, it's very, very, very serious. But we have a great big God. And we're just holding her up to be in his hands at this time and also the family. Brother Condi got to come home from the hospital. And Julia, is he doing wonderful? We want to keep praying, though. For Brother Condi, that the Lord will just completely strengthen him. Those are ones that didn't go up on the screen tonight, so I wanted to tell you about them so you could be praying for all three of those, uh, not just tonight, but as the week goes on. Next week and the week after that, my goodness, we just have so much coming up the rest of this month. I'm going to let you be seated for a moment, and then I'll have you stand again. But I need to tell you about these exciting things Next Monday night, normally we don't do things around here on Monday night, but it was like uh, working a crossword puzzle or a jigsaw puzzle, fitting all of the events of this month into the space. So the best time to have Vacation Bible School this year was next Monday through Thursday. And so it will start Monday night. And uh, instead of our midweek service next Wednesday night we'll be having vacation Bible school going right here so there will be no uh, midweek service on Wednesday evening but any of you that want to are welcome to join us Thursday night everybody say Thursday night because that's going to be our graduation night at 7 30 p.m. right here in the auditorium the final night of vacation Bible school and we're expecting lots of guests so let's Come and support this a week from tomorrow night right here at 730 in the auditorium. And I want to thank all of you for that signed up to help. With, everybody that's helping with Vacation Bible School, stand up right now. I just want to say a great big thank you ahead of time because so many people volunteered and signed up that uh, it's just wonderful. I know there's more than that than <laughs> what is here tonight, but we're so thankful you're involved with Vacation Bible School. The theme, as you have seen on the banner out front, and you see these cards that have been so beautifully designed. God's not dead. He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. And I think we ought to give uh, and this beautiful card because right at the end of Vacation Bible School, a week from this Sunday, is our Friends Day Potluck Picnic at Boland Park at 11 o'clock. And these beautiful, expertly, professionally done designs were done by Sister Heather Larson. Let's give her a hand. It's a lot of work to do this. It's hours of work to, to do something like this with the professional quality with which it's been done. And we are so appreciative for her using that talent for the Lord. Isn't it great that God gives so many different kinds of talent within a body of believers, and we blend and mesh it all together for the uplifting of the kingdom. The following week, the last Sunday of this month, the week following the Friends Day, is our homecoming weekend. We'll have a, a concert on the lawn under a tent in case it's raining. We hope it doesn't rain. But we'll be having a concert beginning at 6 o'clock on Saturday evening, and that's the 28th, on, that's the 29th, and then on Sunday the 30th, we'll be having our special homecoming service under the tent, on the line, on the lawn, and uh, one of our own, Brother Paul Gertz, is coming back to preach that service, and so it's going to be a great time together. I hope you're inviting friends, family, MIAs. And just pray that God will cause them to want to be a part of both the Friends Day and the homecoming. Praise God. A lot going on. 
And I want you to be in prayer for Sister Walker and I. We uh, are leaving tomorrow to go to Atlanta, Georgia to do a marriage conference uh, for one of the churches there. And uh, Sister Walker will be speaking in the adult class on Sunday, and I'll be preaching. And just pray that there will be anointing over all of those sessions in the Holy Ghost and for the advancement of the kingdom and the blessing of marriages and families in that church in Atlanta, Georgia. Let's stand together as we look to the Word of God right now. Tonight I want to turn your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. And uh, I want to read it in the King James, and then I want to read it to you in the Amplified Version. Let's read it in the King James together first. Now, all these things happened unto them, for in samples, he's talked about the children of Israel, how they passed through the cloud, how God delivered them from Egypt, and they passed through the cloud, but some of them did not respond in the right way, and then it talks about how God dealt with them. And then Paul wraps it up to say all of that was a type and shadow. Everybody say an allegory. It really happened. It wasn't a make-believe story. It really happened. But though it really happened, it was an example, an insample, an allegory for us today. They are written for our, our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. How have you been feeling that more and more and more that we're just nearing something very, uh, very remarkable? In the Amplified Version, we read it this way. Now these things befell them by way of a figure as an example and warning to us. They were written to admonish and fit us for right action by good instruction. We in whose days the ages have reached their climax, their consummation and concluding period. That was written almost 2,000 years ago. Not quite, but about 1982 years ago or so, that was written. And if at that point in time, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Paul is saying, in our days, and a day with the Lord is as a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years as a day, and in our days, these last two days, I believe we're nearing the climax, the consummation, and the concluding period. Amen. I just want to teach you from my heart, and I sought the Lord about what to teach you, and I really feel like I have a word that's going to bless you tonight from the heart of the Lord to all of us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want you to speak to us. You use human mouthpieces, human voices. You use humans as conduits. But, Lord, we're not interested in the words of mere man. What we want to hear is your words. We want to hear words that are life-giving and, and have your life in them. And uh, go spirit to spirit from your spirit through your human vessel, to all of our spirits, Lord, to do in us, us and in our spirits what you know needs to be done and will help us, will help us to become all you want us to become and to understand the things you want us to understand and to perceive as you want us to perceive. In Jesus' precious name, I pray this, Lord, unto you. Amen. Praise God. Greet someone, two or three someones, and say spiritual stamina. And you may be seated after you've done that. Spiritual stamina. Slate magazine made headlines today with a headline of its own. Humans should be able to marry robots. You see, the writer 
of that magazine is taking this marriage equality thing to what he considers to be its logical conclusion. Politico recently published an essay titled, It's Time to Legalize Polygamy. New York Magazine carried a long sympathetic essay on what they called zoophilia, touting compassion toward bestiality. Welcome to the brave new world of non-moral, non-religious, secular political correctness. If you look over the school calendar from Montgomery County, Maryland, you'll quickly discover that there's no Christmas or Easter or Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah. Schools are closed for the days coinciding with these religious holidays, but not because the district observes them. Rather, classes are closed because the district expects a high level of student and staff absenteeism on those days. That way, Montgomery County Public Schools can remain decidedly non-religious, despite the decidedly religious convictions of many of their constituents. Target may just have lost me as a customer for life. Now, I normally wouldn't say a way out statement like that, but, you know, I'm just getting sick of this. I've recently heard reports, and maybe you've heard them too, that they are going to stop calling areas of their store by the designations of boys' clothing section or girls' clothing sections, as that is too politically incorrect. I knew, and I told you so, the Supreme Court had opened a Pandora's box with their recent ruling that will have far-reaching negative implications on our society that will not be beneficial. Episcopalian rector Andrew Pettiprin said, and I quote, we have slid down the slippery slope, hurried away from a biblical vision of right-ordered humanity. And our culture now consists of work with no intrinsic end, mind-numbing entertainment, ubiquitous, that means it's everywhere, self-medication, the valorization of every sexual desire and identity under the sun, genetic manipulation, and industrial levels of abortion on demand with the harvesting of baby organs. It's where the United States of America now finds itself. But I'm looking at people that are part of the church of the living God. And you know what I'm saying to all of us tonight? And I feel like it's in the Holy Ghost. Perseverance is the order of the day. As the nautical phrase would say, steady as you go. Let's all say it together. Steady as you go. We will not let this make us go one step to the right, one step to the left. We're going to remain steady as you go based on the Word of God directed by the Spirit of God. No matter what the craziness happening around us is doing. In Jeremiah Chapter 25, the prophet told the nation of Israel. This is Jeremiah 25, 3 in the English Standard Version. For 23 years, the word of the Lord has come to me. And I have spoken how? Persistently to you. But you have not listened. Later, the Lord said of the same people, as recorded in Jeremiah 32, 33, they have turned to me their back and not their face. Sounds like Americans today, doesn't it? Not everybody. Everybody say, not everybody. not everybody. Aren't you thankful we still have a lot of sincere Christians all over this country? We have a lot of Holy Ghost-filled people. We filled up that auditorium in OK City recently with young people on fire for God and hungry for God. Amen. 
but many. And it's just about 50-50 right now in our, our country. In other countries, it's far beyond that of the other westernized nations. But the Lord said of them, they have turned their back to me, their back and not their face. And though I have taught them persistently, this is the Lord speaking through his prophet Jeremiah, the Lord I is that I have taught them persistently. They have not listened to receive instruction. We cannot make our society change, but we can make sure we don't change. Neither the prophet nor his Lord gave up. They continued to speak truth to their culture until the people either repented or faced divine judgment. And that's what's going to happen with America. There are going to be some who will repent and change, and the Lord's gracious mercy will be with open arms to them. But if they do not repent, ultimately, you know, this is not a game. This isn't just a nice little uh, candy uh, cotton society of religion that we're doing. It is not a we just want to make you feel good at all times things. Now, there are churches that are like that today. They only say things that make the people feel good. And, but you know what? I don't read anywhere in the Word of God where God's anointed men were ever like that. What they spoke was truth from the Word of the Lord. And they let people know there was a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned. And people could choose whichever one they wanted. But I'm so glad the Lord doesn't give up on us, aren't you? And we must not give up on people, and we must keep speaking truth in our society. That's what they continue to do. Here's the irony about persistence. Everybody say stamina. Here's the irony about persistence. It takes persistence to persist. <laughs> Think about it. In dealing with spiritual opposition, the longer we obey God, the greater the resistance. Huh. It's a lot like weight training. When we refuse Satan's first temptation, he just escalates his attack. Then we refuse him again, he escalates his attack. We refuse him again, he escalates his attack. And all the time, instead of getting us off track, it just keeps building up our what? Our spiritual muscles. Everybody say our stamina. When we stand against cultural immorality, the culture around us stands against us. That's how we build spiritual muscle and fortitude. In fact, right now we're, oh my, it's going to be a long haul in this Crazy political stuff. It's starting already. But the candidates who have gumption and character are almost being dared to stand up for it because the moment they do, they're going to be absolutely mauled by the society we live in for believing anything that smacks of biblical morality. We need to be praying for everybody involved. Because the Bible says to pray for our nation, to pray for our leaders. How many are just going to not worry but just pray? Yeah, we need to do. We need to pray that people will have strength of character. But anyway, that's how it is. We come and speak truth that is in conflict with the culture around us and the culture stands against us. But we build spiritual fortitude through that and stamina. And the longer we trust God, the more we need to trust God, both for strength today and for eternal results. Henri Nguyen said this, We belong to a generation that wants to see the results of our work. We want to be productive, and we want to see with our own eyes what we have made. You know, it's a nice thing. I've been watching over 
wow, it's been Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, five days. It's been utterly amazing to watch the results of the work these men have been doing outside. Can I hear an amen? And in that kind of work, we get to see the results of our, our work. But there are some parts of God's kingdom that don't work that way. Often our witness for God does not lead to tangible results that we can immediately see. And that's what I want to talk to you about and encourage you about tonight. As faithful witnesses of Jesus, we have to trust that our lives too will be fruitful, even though we cannot see the fruit immediately and cannot see the fruit as we would like to be able to see it. But the fruit of our lives, you see, may be visible only to those who live after us as the Lord tarries. I'll never forget a story that Brother Pasley the first, the Brother Pasley you know's father, told about how the Lord helped him to understand one of his own spiritual problems. Because he said he was always so conscientious, he was sort of wanting to take his own spiritual temperature all the time. And the Lord showed him that when you plant a seed in the ground, you just have to leave it and trust. Everybody say trust. Because what he showed Brother Pesley is you're like the person who plants it but then wants to start digging it up to see if it's sprouted yet or not. But if you do that, what happens? You destroy what's happening in the process. And sometimes we're like that. At least I am. Maybe none of you are. But think about it. John the Baptist didn't live to see the fruit of his labors. John the Baptist did not know that Jesus had given him an incredible compliment that there has been no prophet born of woman like John the Baptist. But he didn't know Jesus said that. Jesus said that while he was in prison. And I don't know that that word ever got back to John the Baptist. So he had his head chopped off of his body not knowing about his fruitfulness. But there are messages preached about John the Baptist all over the world every week. Stephen did not live to see the fruitfulness of his brief ministry in the early church, nor the incredible fruitfulness of the man who watched the coats of those who stoned Stephen to death, namely the Apostle Paul. But I highly doubt that the image of Stephen saying, lay not this sin to their charge right before he died. I don't believe that image was ever very far from the Apostle Paul's consciousness after he had seen the Lord Jesus Christ and been called into the ministry and realized what he was consenting unto. Fruitfulness. But Stephen didn't get to see it. James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, didn't live to see the fruitfulness of the courage of the stand made by him and his fellow apostles to tell all the leaders of the people, we ought to obey God rather than the voice of men. Because not too long after that, he was killed by the sword of Herod to please the people. Why, one would say, would Jesus have put him, knowing this ahead of time of what his life, how his life would end, and how quickly his ministry would be severed? Why would Jesus have put him in the inner circle who saw him transfigured up on the mountain 
if his life and ministry were going to end so soon. Why? You see, folks, hear me tonight. Some questions will never be ours to assess the answers to. Why? Because we are not capable of answering those kinds of questions and that we only see through a glass darkly at this time. Yet, we can be quite sure that James died unaware that John would get a revelation. His own brother John, who lived, they say, to probably a hundred or so, that his own brother John would get a revelation later that James' name, along with the other apostles, would be written on the foundation stones of the new Jerusalem. But he did not know that when he died. He had no idea of the effect of his life. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't get to see that the God they served would later be referred to as the God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob. But they didn't know that at their deaths. Abraham, however, died in faith. The writer of Hebrews tells us not having seen and yet having embraced the promises of God. And he died still looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. But he died not getting those promises as far as he knew, except for Isaac being born miraculously and then God giving him back, as it were, in a figure when the angel stopped him, when he was willing to slay his only son at the command of the Lord on Mount Moriah, which is now the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Isaac died. Think about Isaac's final days. He died not too long after being deceived by his own wife and son. And he died not knowing that deceiving son would have his name changed from Jacob, meaning supplanter, deceiver, to Israel, meaning one who had power with God. And that he would become, that very deceiving son would become the father of the 12 tribes of Israel whose names will be written upon the 12 gates of pearl of the holy city of the new Jerusalem. But Isaac died not knowing of that fruitfulness of his posterity. Jacob died in a strange land that was not the land of promise that his father Isaac had told him would be the inheritance of his grandfather Abraham's descendants. And yet, Jacob died in Egypt. Moses died on Mount Nebo in Moab, not getting to cross the Jordan into the land to which he had spent the last 40 years of his life leading the children of Israel to. All of his Peers had perished in the wilderness, save Joshua, his mentoree, and faithful Caleb. I know another faithful Caleb. Anyone know another faithful Caleb around here? Yeah. Both were from the generation under him. But Moses could not judge from his natural perspective at the time the fruitfulness of his years of service and investment unto God for the kingdom. Think about it. Even David, who had ruled during a time of dominance for the nation of Israel, who had slain a giant, brought the ark back to Jerusalem and gathered the materials for the building of the first temple to house that ark. Yet David died with his sons in dispute and a nation in turmoil over who his rightful successor should be. As great as was King Solomon during the truly golden age of Israel's history, a man whose kingdom was described by the queen of Sheba, who when she actually observed it, uttered what words? Who can remember what words? The half 
has not been told. Even such a king as Solomon, whose reign was a, with abundant wealth and peace, he lost his way despite his God-given wisdom. And in his later years, he allowed his pagan wives to turn his heart away from worshiping only the one true God, Jehovah. After having built the glorious temple for his name and glory, he died saying, all is vanity. Now, what am I trying to help us see tonight? Lest you get depressed. I am trying to tell you that the old saying, you win some and you lose some, is very close to our experience from our natural view in this life. But that natural view is never, everyone say never. Was Abraham's natural view correct? No. Was Isaac's natural view correct? No. Was Jacob's natural view correct? No. And we could go down the line of everybody I've mentioned. No. No, no, no. You see, the natural view that we have is never the same as God's heavenly view. I want you to lift your hands right now and praise God because he's doing things through you you don't even know about. Things that have happened through your life in the past are going to yield fruit that you may never see or know about. But God is using you. You're his vessel. You're his child. And he has chosen to use you. And he has indwelled you for a purpose. And he is going to be fruitful through your life. If you'll just keep your faith in him and keep your spiritual stamina strong and not let your inability to see from a heavenly vision to cause you to lose heart. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. From my natural view, and I'm going to label it that from my natural view. I have invested in many that have gone on to do wonderful things for God. But I've also invested with blood, sweat, tears, and much love into many that seemingly threw it aside like an old shoe to pursue carnal desires and concepts of God that caused them to try to shake God to their liking rather than allow God to shape them to his liking. You have invested in some only to feel like, what's the use? You have heard that accusing voice of the enemy of our soul saying, ah, you're, you're pretty fruitless. And then he'll throw someone else that you don't know the whole story, but it looks like they're so much more fruitful at that moment from what he's saying to you, then you are, and you start listening to him because it, oh, he can make it look true. He tell, puts enough truth in his lies to be convincing. But he's never telling the full truth. Now, you have had such hope for some in which you have invested, yet you've seen those hopes fail to come to fruition at least at this time. Everybody say, at this time. But I'm here tonight in the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry, I, I must be doing something wrong here. But I'm here to remind you from the Word of God not to judge your life or your effectiveness in the unseen future by what you see or fail to see in the present human analysis, much less according to the lying, distorted, accusing voice of Satan. I am so thankful from my heart of hearts for every seed I've been allowed to see burst forth into fruitfulness, and God's allowed me to see that in many cases. 
but I am called to keep trusting my Lord's ability to bring fruitfulness from seeds I, in my limited perspective, would judge to have been unfruitful. None of us turns around and say that even means you. None of us can rightly judge our own degree of fruitfulness. So stop digging up the soil and trying to take your own spiritual temperature. Only the righteous judge of all the earth who sees from an eternal perspective can rightly make those calls. So my job and your job is to keep sowing in faith and hope and not dig up those seeds. Some seeds spring up quickly. Other seeds germinate for long periods of time. Some seeds that have been long thought dead have later sprung up to the surprise of many. I was pulling weeds this spring out on the lawn and I thought, it's onions. What are onions doing in this seed bed? I don't think any of you secretly, surreptitiously planted onions in that bed. Someone told me this used to be farmland. And from all those decades ago, would have now had to have been about 50 years ago at least, a half century ago, there's still onions coming up. And let me tell you something. There's going to be some righteous seed coming up from the seed you sowed 50 years after you're gone, if the Lord will tarry. And it's still happening from seeds that were sown by people who have been gone for 50 years that were our apostolic leaders in the early part of the 20th century. So my job is to keep sowing in faith and hope. That's your job too. Because... It so often happens that after many who have sowed those seeds are no longer around to see what has sprung from their labors, fruitfulness starts coming from what they did all that long time ago. So no wonder we find the Apostle Paul reminding us twice under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to be persistent in spiritual stamina, to not let Neither our weariness nor our seeming lack of the results we had hoped for ever to deter us from continuing to sow lovingly into the lives of those within our range and within our reach. In fact, let's look at it from the Word of God. Galatians 6, 9, and 10 in the Amplified. And let us not, read it with me, and let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due time and at the appointed season we shall reap if we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. Everybody say spiritual stamina. So then, as occasion and opportunity open up to us, let us do good morally to all people. Not only useful or profitable to them, but also doing what is for their spiritual good and advantage. Be mindful to be a blessing, especially to those of the household of faith, those who belong to God's family with you, the believers. We aren't just to treat outsiders. You know, I've, I've seen people that, well, I shouldn't say I've seen people. I've heard of people. Does that sound better? I've heard of people that are, so nice to people they don't know. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but the Bible tells us we need to be good to everybody. And that's those closest. In fact, we need to excel in being good to our own family members whether it's the church family or a natural family. Then Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to the Thessalonian Christians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, And as for you, brethren, do not become weary or lose heart in doing right, but continue in well-doing without weakening. 
What is important is how well, you know what? Let's go to this one. Testing. What is important is how well and how persistently we love. What have we been learning? Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I'm become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Because love will cause me to treat people right. Love will cause me to be compelled by the Spirit of God within me to keep sowing his seeds of truth spoken with love. Amen. God will make our love fruitful, whether we see that fruitfulness or not. So let's just keep loving people enough to tell them the truth, because you're not loving people if you don't tell them the truth. But you've got to tell them the truth with grace. And let's ask God for the persistence to persist. Where do you need spiritual stamina today? Let's ask ourselves personally that question. Where do I need some spiritual stamina today? Just right now, rhetorically, ask yourself that. In what area have you been tempted to wonder, is this really making a difference? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I pretty well know the human condition by 40 years plus of pastoring. There are some of you sitting right here that are, have been thinking, the things I'm doing, are they really making a difference? All of this that I've said tonight is for now. The word to you tonight is to lift that very area of concern up to the Lord in faith and persist in being persistent and leave the temperature reading and the fruitfulness meter to him. Even Jesus died as a failure in the eyes of men. Yet that death was the very springboard of life and victory for the whole world. Jesus himself died in the eyes of men as a failure on the cross. There was no success there to be proud of by human measurement at that moment. Even his disciples ran away and hid in despair. Yet the fruitfulness of Jesus' life is beyond any human measure. I'm going to conclude this study with the words that I said earlier tonight. Though God sometimes blesses us to see the fruit of our labors to a degree, for which we are so thankful to him. Can I hear an amen when we get to see that? We must remember and understand as you stand with me, listen closely. As faithful witnesses of Jesus, we have to trust that our lives, too, will be fruitful. Even though we cannot see, most likely, the lion's share of that fruit. The greater fruit of our lives may be visible only to those who live after us. As the Lord tarries, I want you to lift up that area that you've been hearing, that voice, either from within you or from without. Is this really mattering? Is this really making any significant difference? I, I'm telling you, the Lord is talking to us tonight. The Lord has commissioned me to, to teach this to you tonight because the Lord is wanting you to know you've got to stop judging it by what you can see right now. You've got to stop looking at it from your human perspective. You've got to stop. You have to start seeing it.
that when you've offered it up and done your best unto God, that he knows how to make fruitful what looks to you like it is not being fruitful at this present moment. He knows how to bring fruitfulness out of it in ways you may never get to see it, but you've got to trust him and lift it up and keep doing it unto him in faith and trust and the understanding that only he has that eternal perspective to judge the fruitfulness of those areas of your life you're in doubt about. Thank you, Jesus. Mori anda la boki la bo shanta la bo sorry bo sata la bo sanda. Oh, I know in the Holy Ghost I'm talking to some people from the heart of God tonight. You've got to stop listening to that voice because it's not even close to the truth. And you must not let yourself become weary in well doing. You must not lose heart because when we understand that only his eternal perspective is the pure, clear lens through which things can be accurately judged and seen in their fruitfulness, it builds spiritual stamina in us to keep on doing right to keep on doing what he's enabled us to do and called us to do for his kingdom, for his people, and to just keep loving and letting that love flow through us in demonstrative ways that he enables us to show it, to serve him by serving his people and his work. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, precious Lord Jesus. Thank you, precious Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, precious Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mori anda la bori a boscia la bocchi la bori a bossa tala bosso la bosca la bocchi la bossa che mo coscia tala bopori a bossa tala bosso ria mo chi la bopori a bossa tala bossa anda la bori a bocchi ti alla bossa la bopori a bossa la bopori a bocchi la bossa ria mondo ria bossa tala bosso tori a bossa Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Shama talabori abosha talabokuri abosha talabokole bokole bosha. Uri amata labosondori abosha laboki labokosha. I want you to go to someone right now. I want you to go to someone and 
and pray with them and for them and and pray that they will know and understand that God is working through them no matter what they're seeing. God is working his work through them. Find someone to pray with them and encourage them because our God is working through his people. There is not a one of us that he idly has baptized into his body of believers without knowing that he has appointed us unto responsibilities and work in his kingdom that will be made fruitful by his power and his authority, his anointing in his timing and in his way. And we just don't have the ability to judge that ourselves. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, how we thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, precious God. Oh, Lord, I thank you for this people, Lord. I thank you for this people, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you that your anointing is upon us as your people. To help us and use us. Lord, you said even those less comely. 